thank you and welcome to uh, today's webcast uh, sponsored by uh, Guavis uh, and Amazon. We have uh, today a session that's focused on securing digital transactions and it's all meant to help um, retailers, online retailers, understand how they can better monetize and promote uh, their capabilities. What's underpinning those capabilities is the network. And this is really geared towards um, those carrier service or communication service providers out there who are trying to build better networks to support uh, the diversity of traffic um, and interests of their subscribers. You know, in, in recent uh, events such as uh, COVID-19, the pandemic has really become a global accelerator for change within a variety of industries. And now more than ever, as consumers, we are looking towards e-commerce as that supply chain, if you will. It's the supply line, more importantly, in order to gain access to valuable and essential goods. I know myself, I relied quite heavily in the beginning of the lockdown on uh, Amazon in particular. Um, the, the, you know, the retail sector has been going through a transformation for years, uh, over a decade plus, uh, long before the pandemic. But recently, it's really hit a fever pitch. Um, now, there's a higher level of volume of transactions more than ever, and we're really moving towards contactless mobile payments. And this is, you know, an important way of how do we transact in the, uh, the light of the pandemic. But it also can bring new uh, risks associated with potential fraud. And consumers really don't want to have their digital identities or their bank accounts hacked. Um, you know, where this intersects with the CSP community is that CSPs are providing that reliable network communication. They're the ones who are effectively creating the highway for that supply line, uh, that critical supply line that every one of us need, both in the pandemic and every day as we transact. Um, what's needed out there is really reliable network connectivity for that virtual storefront, for that e-commerce experience. Also, it's got to be not only a reliable network, but also a secure network for securing di digital payments and to enable those online retailers to also take advantage of information about the subscribers and, and users themselves so they can better uh, tailor, if you will, offers and monetize that information as they do so. Now, our speakers today, I'm very uh, thankful to have three extremely knowledgeable speakers focused on these particular topics. First, I have uh, Ross McWalter. He is a global telecom AI and ML solutions and partner portfolio lead over at Amazon's Web Services. Welcome, welcome Ross. Thank you, I really appreciate being here and I look forward to sharing some of my experiences at Amazon with the, the audience here, thank you. Excellent. I also have uh, uh, Solomon Cates, or Saul. Um, he's our principal technologist within the CTO office at Talus's Cloud Protection and Licensing Product and Business Unit. Um, he's gonna talk a little bit about um, how CSPs can help protect transactional data from an e-commerce perspective. Uh, to prevent fraud and secure the infrastructure that's effectively powering the retailer. Uh, so, uh, Saul, it's great to have you on today. Good to see you. Looking forward to it. And lastly, with great pre uh, pleasure, I have uh, uh, Nico Carré, who is a Director of Product Management at Guavis, and he'll be exploring how CSPs can better uh, leverage and, uh, and enable online retailers with high-value marketing analytics uh, for um, really understanding their subscribers better, their habits and content interests, so they can tailor those offers and ultimately monetize that information. Nico, it's great to have you on today. Thank you. Hi, Stephen. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Ross McWalter once again. Thank you, Ross, for uh, attending and, and uh, being a panelist on today's session, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And I'll step into my presentation now. Just one second. And hopefully you can uh, see my screen now. So I'm going to step through um, from the retail perspective, you know, a little bit of history of kind of Amazon, how we've we've built out the um, uh, the the platform, and then kind of touch on how that's enabled uh, some of the the retail angle in in the recent uh, pandemic. So you're kind of starting with the, the mission statement of Amazon ultimately. It's, it's very simple. It's to be the Earth's most customer-centric company. And, you know, it's a very broad meaning, uh, but what it does, it doesn't restrict Amazon to a certain domain in the market. So it's not defined by an industry, a geography, or a technology. It's really just focused on the customer. And um, ultimately, it's our, it's our North Star. It doesn't restrict us to selling books or e-commerce. It really just ultimately focuses on that customer and it drives all of the decisions that are made within Amazon 
as an organization, also Amazon Web Services. So, you know, when it comes down to critical decisions, it really comes down to, is this decision uh, customer obsessed? And really, what is the best thing to do for our customers? So every year, uh, Jeff Bezos releases a shareholder letter. And again, um, more often than not, it's very customer obsessed. And, you know, when we look at innovation and Amazon, again, is often listed, uh, you know, in, at the top of the list around innovation, everything that is done at Amazon is to innovate on behalf of our customers. So it's not that things are invented in isolation. It's putting the customer at the center of everything that we do at both Amazon and AWS. So all of the products and services that are used um, that we produce at AWS for as building blocks, if you like, that are used by Amazon.com and on all of our millions of customers are based on customer feedback. So that's over 90%. The remaining 10% are um, based on our understanding of the customer and working very closely with customers to invent on their behalf. So an example of that would be Amazon Prime, let's say. I mean, no customer explicitly asked for Amazon Prime, but we saw signals in the market that the market was looking for a service like Prime. So if we step through the kind of Amazon timeline, um, and ultimately when you start with your customers, it, it opens you up to really kind of explore and innovate in, in a number of different areas. So you know, I think everybody knows that Amazon started as a, an online bookstore, but then kind of expanded into different categories, you know, first with CDs and DVDs, and then obviously ultimately with uh, cloud computing and AWS, but then moving into, you know, devices like Kindle and Echo. And, um, you know, Amazon is a TV and film production studio now. We have physical stores that actually have actual items that you can pick up and touch. So, um, you know, we, as we said, ultimately focusing on the customer, it kind of starts to make sense why Amazon really has diversified into a number of different areas, which on the face of it may seem fairly abstract and disconnected, but ultimately they are connected by the customer. So when we think again about Amazon, I think that it's almost the de facto standard around customer experience, the web experience being frictionless. So always thinking about how do we kind of make that simpler for our customers? And, um, you know, whether that is, you know, uh, removing the friction from logging onto the onto the, the website, uh, picking up your um, your shopping, if you like, after you've you've bought something online. Which again, within the the kind of COVID environment, again, a lot of people move to uh, the on shopping the online shopping model. Um, and then the, the kind of patented one-click checkout to, to kind of, again, remove the friction of the experience of purchasing online to Amazon Go or what we what we know of called the Just Walkout Store, which now has been essentially syndicated to um, a number of different uh, locations across um, North America, which really is, again, removing the friction of that experience to, um, uh, excuse me, uh, removing that experience to uh, actually walking out of the store so that certainly in, um, you know, locations where there are a lot of foot traffic, you can walk in and walk out and not have the pain of lining up. Um, so moving on to what we, I guess, is ultimately the DNA of, of Amazon. And um, what you see here is actually a kind of image of Amazon.com microservices structure circa... I think 2009, um, and in Amazon they, they realized very early on the need to break down the kind of traditional monolith and kind of build out uh, microservices API based infrastructure to drive uh, both speed and agility. And you can see here the rate of change of the Amazon.com website as those changes are pushed out to that infrastructure in a very, very dynamic fashion. So think of the scale of Amazon.com and how frequently we actually drive updates to that. But the actual genesis of AWS and the ability to, to be agile and share that with our ultimately our end customers was Amazon.com and that infrastructure that was um, engineered in a scalable and agile way. So um, if you look at this um, 
uh, equation that we've kind of coined internally around what what it takes to innovate. Um, you take those mechanisms, which, for example, in Amazon would be the working backwards mechanism, which is focusing on the customer and working back from their problems. You tie that to an architecture that's extremely agile. So we provide our customers with this flexible portfolio of building blocks and services that they can build from. You tie that to culture, which is that innovative culture. You know, Amazon has got the 14 leadership principles with the customer obsession being um, the number one principle that, that kind of, um, again, is the North Star. And then you combine that with the um, the other components, and then you you have a mechanism for innovation that we we broadly share within Amazon. So as we start moving into the mobile um, environment, and again within the kind of COVID nineteen era, if you like, you know a lot of people have defaulted in into the mobile world, and we're going to look at some of the building blocks that we have provided at AWS to to drive the agility and innovation and reduce the, the, the time to market so that um, a lot of our customers can, can manage uh, their this COVID environment within this business world that we live in now. So we're gonna look at a, a service called um, Amazon Amplify. Um, and we see that more companies have had to adopt to these mobile first strategy. And it's driven by an increase in people accessing the, the internet via the mobile devices. Um, Obviously, COVID has forced everybody to accelerate their digital transformations. I mean, I think if everybody walks into a restaurant these days, every restaurant has had to have a, a digital version of their menu on your device. So you'll scan a QR code, it will pop up in your device. I mean, none of those restaurants, you know, kind of six months ago or more would have thought that they would have to transform and provide that level of service. But now, Lots of those uh, retail establishments have got online uh, mechanisms in place so you can actually purchase via your mobile device. So it's been forced to, you know, the adoption was there, it's been accelerated. And we see now that, you know, there's been, you know, over 4 million apps actually uploaded into app stores since 2019, generating $120 billion of revenue. So it, it really is um, the kind of way forward and, and again, certainly accelerated by COVID. So if we look at this uh, AWS Amplify application and how it's been used by our customers, certainly in this COVID environment, part of it is to accelerate uh, getting to market, if you like. So building you know, mobile and web applications is, is not easy. Um, and what Amplify is allowing our customers to do is, is kind of, you know, use existing skill sets to develop these Android, iOS, or web applications. Um, and we've used a use case centric uh, feature set so that these, these can actually allow you to scale very, very quickly. Um, and also it's using a set of uh, tools that are allowing our customers to build uh, very, very quickly full stack applications on, on AWS. And these open source libraries are allowing our, our customers to innovate. I mean, there's a lot of competition out there. So allowing you to um, build your customer experience and have that frictionless experience leveraging this, these building blocks, again, is accelerating that time to value. And then ultimately, um, part of that customer experience is performance. Um, and you know, this all of our services come with AWS best practices of security, availability, reliability. So that's all built into the app. And at the end of the day, you just want to build an app that just works. And then obviously it's integrated on the back end from the mobile front end into AWS on the back end so that you can actually leverage those services and scale and innovate. So I'm going to move on to um, an example that we saw of, of innovation within this kind of COVID-19 pandemic era. So many of you would have heard of um, Orange Theory, um, really a kind of fitness phenomenon, if you like, that um, since 2010, they've grown you know, extremely rapidly. You have over 1,200 studios uh, located across you know, the 50 states and 23 countries. Um, and as of 2020, they had um, over a million members and they'd surpassed a billion dollars in global sales. So 
obviously with COVID, you know, with social distancing and lockdowns and shutdowns and restrictions, this impacted a lot of businesses. So one way to mitigate that was, again, to, to find a way to, to enter the home of the consumer with the same experience. So, um, you know, Orange, Fit, Orange Theory Fitness turned to AWS to see how they could be uh, agile and accelerate that development cycle. So um, using our Amplify application within a week, you can see here they could actually turn that around and provide that experience to their customers at home. And this integrated the full workout experience, in, in, integrated media, video, um, and um, this really was... Um, you know, adopted broadly by the customer base and has allowed Orange Theory during that time to continue with their brand and serving their customers. Thank you very much, Ross. Um, before we get to Solomon, I'm just going to say, you know, as as a user and you know, a user of Amazon, your capabilities, your services, and 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 the retail experience, I've not seen an enterprise like Amazon in the marketplace today that is close and engaged on the mobile platform, but also just with the end customer with respect to a multi-channel experience, you know, whether it be access on a web application, a web browser, whether it be through the native app on the, on the iPhone or Android, or even Dash um, as an extension of that inside the home. And then with Alexa, uh, providing that sort of that AI-driven experience and that integration into the retail part. It's, it's, uh, it's an embracing of the retail experience on a multi-front that I think has dr driven a tremendous amount of success uh, for your business and it also is a model for others. So very exciting. And with that, I have an interesting uh, poll question to ask our audience. Where do you start your retail search for a product or service? Is it a mobile browser? Amazon application, a native application, as I just mentioned, is it a desktop app? Is it a, you know, is it through a browser or some kind of uh, capability, or is it through a website? Um, it looks like the overwhelming majority of you leverage uh, your mobile browser or a desktop-oriented experience, which makes sense. As I just mentioned, there's a variety through a multi-channel experience on how you get to retail, um, online retail. But the mobile browser, by and large, the largest percentage, uh, which makes sense in the context of today's session, and furthermore, um, the importance, if you will, of the mobile infrastructure to support the retail experience. Um, you know, in that retail experience, I'll just say, you know, what customers are looking for and what CSPs really need to do is to drive not only access, but trust. And in, in addition to the trust, the security, engender hopefully the growth and adoption of those capabilities. So it's really about secure and you know, a highly reliable network experience as we move from the bricks and mortar to the clicks and mortar uh, transformation. And then as you know the responsibility of the retailer grows and the importance level, they depend more and more on telecommunications. And telecommunications really becomes a partner. And then lastly the dimension that you know probably we neglect to recognize, but it behind the scenes is really, really important, is regulatory compliance as a retailer as it relates to securing uh, private uh, information of, of those subscribers and that uh, transactional data. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand over to Saul Cates, who again is our principal technologist within the CTO, op, op, uh, CTO office at Talus's Cloud Protection and Licensing Business Unit. Saul, if you'd be so kind um, to um, share your screen, and then uh, we'll get you started. Thanks again, Saul, for being on today's panel. Welcome. Perfect. Thank you, everybody, and I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about uh, data security, uh, cloud security, and, and quite a bit about the transformation that a lot of organizations are going through as they go from, as you said, brick and mortar to click and mortar and transforming how they deliver their capabilities. And then... With that, there's a lot of um, challenges organizations go through, particularly on the transformation of where data goes, but that ultimately transforms into a large conversation around encryption keys, which is, while it sounds silly, it actually is one of the most common conversations that we have with our customers early on in their adoption of cloud because the regulatory 
uh, nature of the data they might be migrating because they used to do this in you know traditional data centers now they're moving to the cloud there's a lot of things that challenge them to do that so before we hop in into the individual um, challenges and what some of the transformational strategies that people are are issuing or going through we should probably talk a little bit about the trends and what they were before the, the pandemic and what we could probably extrapolate what they'll look like you know going into next year um, because if you look at last year businesses were already planning on having you know about a 50% you know, we're having a, a multi cloud strategy as part of their transformation and services whether it's infrastructure whether it's platform as a service um, you're taking on capabilities from providers like Amazon and, and others um, really allows them to uh, you know a have flexibility of choice the price of capabilities and so forth um, but also the, the 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 needs of the business as they grow in a given region they need a given uh, affiliate or integration points so as the the world has changed so as a strategy of businesses and and one cloud provider will not uh, usually deliver everything for a customer, but they are going to have their primary secondaries and those that they want to partner up with. Um, but as as they do that, one of the things that everybody's sort of learning, or at least uh, we we sort of help uh, people identify this sort of problem in the industry, is there is this shared responsibility. Just because you go to a cloud provider doesn't mean that all your problems go away. Do you still have stewardship over data, whether it's PII, you have transactional requirements. So if you're doing PCI transactions, you must make sure you're, you've got the appropriate um, scoping and certifications. So there's all sorts of different things that you must uh, uh, go through. And when you're looking at a cloud environment, um, you must look at it as a shared responsibility because it's not all the cloud provider and it's not all yours. It's actually split uh, fairly heavily across the, uh, is it a shared responsibility or is it the cloud provider? It's pretty much split across all three. Um, and if you look at the, you know, sort of the back, you know, offices and sort of how people are looking to actually do the integration across both on-prem applications and the cloud, you know, they're trying to figure out how do they, you know, rectify traditional application management or security management or data security because they've had traditional systems and, and process and, uh, I don't know, audits that are regular that are, are governed around their systems and, and as they move to the cloud they are trying to find a way or some are uh, trying to find a way to unify those systems of controls whether it's around access or keys or sensitive data because in the cloud you have different architectures um, and you have different components and, and and whatnot but also different actors and players throughout your organization will be participating um, you know and if you roll back you know, five, 10 years ago before there was cloud, uh, rarely would anybody in finance be involved in any cloud um, you know, uh, or any, uh, any IT decisions outside of cost shavings and so forth. Nowadays, they are you know, very front and center talking about how are we gonna change our operational cost models using cloud providers and reaching out through them to understand where they can go. So you're seeing financial uh, support within the organization start to plumb into not just the security aspects of it, but also the cost savings and so forth of transformations. But they need to figure out that again, uniform between both secure and operation, you know, security and operations of a multi-cloud hybrid and you know, what do you call it, on-prem or self-managed new world. Um, and you know, one thing that, that's been found is about half the organizations you know that have gone out up there and are migrating to the cloud, only about half of them are actually uh, protecting their sensitive data up there. And the fact that 50% uh, actually acknowledge that that is sort of you know alarming that uh, they know that they have, and the other 51% um, are not, and they're bold enough to say that we are not, and, and we know it's sensitive. So some of them have the you know again the the the, the mixed uh, understanding of where their responsibility is for their data and understanding that by looking at your options is, is, is very uh, important when you're looking for how do I want to actually take control of my destiny, take control of my keys and, and security as I migrate throughout different cloud providers. So if we really want to talk about what is the, the, the you know, sort of challenge that organizations have as they migrate to the cloud, they need to look at cloud security as a shared responsibility. It's not just the cloud providers, not just yours. It will be a, a coordinated effort between the parties, and you need to understand where the line uh, is drawn. So Amazon actually does a very good job of 
saying exactly what the responsibility of the customer is regarding data of the, the or security of the data and, and whatnot. And they give you lots of capabilities and platforms, but you're still um, uh, capabilities in the platform, but you're still responsible ultimately for the driving of that. You and your organization are going to consume it, dictate it, and operationalize your business around it with, of course, the help of expertise. So this gives you a clear line of where your you know, controls are. And when you're talking to things like your auditors and your regulatory compliance, you need to have a very clear um, line as to who's responsible for what so you can document them appropriately. You can rely upon third-party validations and audits and so forth. Um, similar with other providers like Azure and others, you, if you look at a given capability, so like an infrastructure as a service versus a SaaS, um, the responsibility of the customer uh, is much higher in an infrastructure as a service because you have more control. You have more widgets, you can do more things, you're taking raw infrastructure and doing things with it. Whereas if you get up to SaaS, it relies more and more on the, um, the platform provider or the service provider to handle a lot of the security and compliance and, and, and regulatory um, things for you. However, you still are quite often still in charge of your data classification and accountability. So for example, if you went into a SaaS service like a Workday or what have you, you've only got, um, uh, you, you, you are putting in data. So if you decide to put sensitive data in the notes field, um, that's your organization's um, uh, choice. And you've just actually done something you're, you're not supposed to do because sensitive data going in the cloud doesn't mean it's just files and folders and databases. It means that people transitioning their, how they do business and they're now using online tools that might've been done in brick and mortar before. So as they you know uh, migrate their data to the cloud, um, you know, they, they need to make sure that they protect it. So it, it, we found out that about 71% of our enterprises out there use uh, sensitive data in cloud, whether it's for transactions, whether it's for big data, whether it's for analytics and so forth. However, again, only about 30% are actually encrypting uh, in, in those environments. So they know that they're not quite doing best practices. They know they're supposed to, but they're taking advantage of the cloud as quickly as possible. Um, so just from a, a, a uh, you know, taking a sort of sidestep, what are your sort of, you know, uh, first starting points when you when you begin talking about protecting of your data in cloud? One of the, the common techniques is encryption. Just it's it's a math control. You can use encryption keys that are governed hopefully by good technology or good process or separation of duties. And there's lots of ways to implement encryption. I, we've seen it every single way. Uh, I've been working in encryption for 20, almost 20, 30 years now. Um, in different uh, aspects. And encryption is just a way for us to put control around something, usually data. Um, but the keys are what the, the it all comes down to because where the keys are residing is sort of important. If the keys are sitting there locked up in a vault or if you've locked up your data in a vault and you've got the keys sort of you know, taped to the side of the vault, it doesn't really do you much good if the guards could just literally go get the keys and unlock it and take it with them. So you have no Control. You don't want to have the keys next to the data as a common principle in, in encryption. Well, when you get to the cloud, that becomes a challenge because the cloud needs to be able to use, leverage your data or use your data or provide value to you through your data, again, through analytics or whatever the service might be, but you need to have control over it. So this panacea of a requirement has been around in the Cloud Security Alliance for quite some time, the EKM uh, 4 is basically looking for how would you do encryption and key management. And the idea is you never store the keys in the cloud. I mean, store is, is the term here. You don't store and manage them in the cloud long-term. You hopefully leverage encryption that you have some control. However, to date, that has been a odd conversation or, or a struggle for organizations to get through because what does that mean, All right? And, and traditionally in the on-prem data center, they knew exactly what key management meant. So they had things like HSMs, key management services, cryptographers and crypto teams that did everything to make sure that they were doing the right things with their CA or their um, you know, payment transactions or whatever it was that was driving the, the need for encryption. Um, when you get to cloud, what does that mean? Because your responsibility will vary based upon, again, what kind of service am I, what kind of capabilities do they have? Everybody that's in the cloud has done something slightly different. Um, you know, Amazon has a, uh, a particular approach versus a Google or a, a, a SaaS platform. So your availability of what you can do to manage your encryption keys. And this is something that's actually written down quite often in regulation. 
you know, if it's HIPAA data, if it's PCI or payment data, PII, if it's um, European information or, or PII, there's lots of things you have to do simply because the, of the type of data it is. And that means things like key management come into that conversation. So when you're in a, when you're in a, in a shared responsibility uh, model, you know, what does that mean? Is it the full maintenance of it? Is it just a piece of it? Is it just the creation and, 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 and availability of the keys? Where are they stored? All those questions start to spawn from there. So you end up with this sort of problem that we've experienced over, you know, uh, in, in, in the industry. And we sort of express it as the security admin in the middle. Um, you know, traditionally, they've known how to manage their security controls and encryption keys and all this, you know, effort they've been going through for the last, you know, 10 plus years, 20 years, maybe, um, to protect their data inside their infrastructure based upon either PCI or HIPAA or whatever the requirements. But now the cloud has come or the, the, the business has made them accelerate their adoption to cloud. So integrating and, and, and harmonizing their business process across multiple different providers that have all done it slightly different or significantly different is where they end up with a sort of challenging problem. Do I have to solve this with tech? Do I do this with process and, and, and procedure? Do this with people? Um, or do I find partners out there to help me solve this? Because ultimately you don't want to be the stopgap or at least the security operator usually doesn't want to be the person that's stopping the adoption of a cloud service. But at the same time, as you saw from those survey results, we don't want to have this continued reckless abandon of getting to the cloud and not protecting the data because that's where the problems emerge. You know, it's it's post-mortem that the breach is, is discussed about how the data was not encrypted. It's never, um, you never hear about the, the breach where the data was encrypted because it was encrypted and they don't have to disclose. If you can prove it, that's the way it works in most disclosures. So getting to that another next level, um, but in a shared responsible uh, uh, infrastructure is the challenge that a lot of organizations have, have, have sort of um, you know, tried to embrace. So if you look through the last, you know, probably five to, to six years, these two new, uh, these two sort of approaches to how do I do a shared encryption and key management uh, model with my cloud providers. And again, they're all over the place and, and, and Talos uh, sells technology to help our organizations and, and, and customers adopt a either one of these two approaches, whether I'm bringing my own keys or holding my own keys. Um, I have the ability to control what keys are used to protect what data and, and in some cases even have control over what services can ultimately use my data or use my keys for my data um, and keep it in my control and try to remove that responsibility or at least that availability of access to that data from the cloud, the cloud provider themselves. So we call these bring your own key and hold your own key. Bring your own key, um, something that just sort of emerged over a, a trend that happened throughout a couple of uh, infrastructure providers and some SaaS providers early on creating a capability for customers to basically inject an encryption key or, or give them a key to use on their behalf for sets of time. Um, and that's what we call bring your own key. It's it's like, you know, bring your own device. You bring your own key to the provider and you're saying, please use this key on my behalf to protect the data and I will manage it through either some APIs or a key management system and so forth. Um, there, there's good to, you know, pros and cons to this. You know, one of the, 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 the benefits is you have full control over the pedigree. You know where the key, key came from and you have a backup copy because you originated it, right? So if you ever had to recover, you have the ability to recover fairly elegantly. Um, however, you know, some of the, the minuses are things like you've just granted that key to the platform. And, and while the platform can do some very good things to attest that they are doing good things with your crypto key um, and, and, and what have you, they, uh, they they ultimately are you know, basically granted access to it for a set amount of time under your conditions. So you know, there, there's very little control you have once it's in their hands, other than hopefully the tools respect your wishes. The other approach, though, is hold your own key. And this is something new. It's emerging. Um, we're seeing more and more of it in the industry. And it's an architecture that we, of course, you know, have supported and, and pioneered for many years, um, where we want our customers to actually have full control over the most critical thing, which is the key that unlocks everything whether it's data encryption keys, um, CA, what have you, we, we want that in the customer's hands. So we have a fairly large set of technologies, but one of our newer ones is called EKMS, where we basically are allowing technology providers and, and cloud providers to integrate a new API that lets the customer have full control over their key and their usage of those keys throughout the entire world. 
it's literally a URL call away so that we can allow for customers and technology providers to say, under what conditions do I want this key material to be available to do a data thing in the cloud, which might be selling a transaction, it could be running a big query analytics, um, it could be a lot of things that are powering you know, the, the, the business on the other side, but the decision to allow it to, be ha to happen in a cloud provider under the right conditions is something that now can be driven through a policy-based approach and you hold your key in your own hand. And at that last second, you say yes, technology or yes, cloud provider, communications provider, whatever that might be, you are allowed to do this operation under my behalf using a key that stays in my jurisdiction of choice. So when it comes to things like encryption and key management, they might sound like deep, uh, um, you know, crypto security nerdy thingies, but in reality, they actually um, govern a lot of our uh, availability of services in certain regions. Uh, for example, GDPR governs a lot of where things run. So where the key material is managed, stored, and ultimately that data is being used and operated on are all the conversation pieces you have. So understanding where your data is, where the keys are to protect that data, and under whose power they are, whether it's yours or your provider or it's shared, are the things that you, as you transition into the cloud, need to succinctly understand um, um, because you are going to be adopting other people's infrastructure and you need to know what your responsibility for your data is because ultimately um, it could be a conversation around again encryption keys so with that I'll, I'll turn it back over to Stephen to, to, to hand it off to Nico um, but hopefully that was informative and not too boring on the crypto side thank you Saul yeah actually great amount of detail in, in an area of technology that many assume is just there you know subscribers assume that retailers have strong security perspectives and, and postures um, and you know in, in i guess in the example you know most of us assume that you know the door is locked on the retail site you know but do we really know as a as a, as a subscriber or user of the system you know would you leave your front door unlocked for instance and you know have a have a an open entry into your house uh you'd lock it you know you'd secure it it's much the same uh retailers have to protect what's inside and what's inside are not only the access to their products but the access to their customers information so those those retailers that have best practices around how to handle data as you mentioned as well as um, securing that information with strong encryption technology are the best and those that communicate those practices periodically with their their customers and subscribers are the ones that will really make it to the other side. They're the ones, they're the ones that'll survive. Um, the ones who do regular contact and communication about breaches and about changes to privacy policies, improvements in privacy policies, things that affect that personal identifiable information that you mentioned before. So I think as the next generation of retailers is emerging in this pandem pandemic time and beyond, um, having strong security posture is absolutely critical. And the network, you know, think about it this way, the CSP is not only the superhighway for the supply line, but also they themselves are a retailer as they are offering a service that is charging a, a fee and additional upsell products that they can position and sell and market to their customers like phones and packages and rate plans, et cetera. Those are transactions that happen online. They need to be thinking in the same way that the traditional online retailer is. Um, I'm going to launch our next poll, um, which is about how does your organization manage your security responsibilities today? Whether you're in a telecom or you're a retailer or you're in a bricks and mortar business, how does your organization manage your cloud security responsibility today? I don't think there's one business out there that doesn't have a presence online and some kind of um, attachment to the cloud today as a you know use of the the content in the cloud or using you know from a website perspective or using critical applications that are um, running in the cloud. Um, almost all the companies that I work with and have worked for are running major parts of their IT infrastructure in the cloud. So out of the following, is it a shared responsibility model with your cloud provider? Is it following best practices and guidelines in the industry? It, do you not use cloud at all? I, I, I would have to assume that you know you'd be in the minority. But if you don't use cloud, you don't have enough. You know, you don't think that there's enough security data control, or maybe you're just not sure. So if you could uh, please enter in your response in just a moment, I will close the poll and show you the response. 
it looks like many of you are around half of you are in the shared responsibility model which is you know the mentioned earlier in the presentation with Saul you know where most of the cloud providers are working today with their enterprise style customers um, it puts the onus and burden both on the provider and on uh, the customer themselves and then many of you are still unsure but beyond that the second uh, tide was um, following best practice from an industry perspective as we transition over to the next uh, panelist in the discussion, you know, what comes to mind here is, and I mentioned it before, is the importance of the CSP, of the communication service provider to deliver a secure, reliable network. It's not just about access, it's about trust and the ability to grow, um, meaning, you know, to be able to take advantage of that rich subscriber information. Um, CSPs, if they do this right, they can enable better engagement technique uh, for customer experience with their mobile subscribers and supporting a variety of multiple devices. They can also monetize the information um, to increase potential top line revenue. Now, our next presenter, Nico Carre, is a particular expert in this category. And I will transition over to Nico. Thank you very much, Ivan. Look, I think it's a very good timing. You, you, you said it right. It's about surviving for some uh, some of the, the retail industry players. And I think, you know, they need maximum help. And I'm just going to talk about how CSPs can actually help uh, this industry based on our experience on the market. So to, um, to get started, uh, you know, I think we, we all agree that bringing products to consumers is a fundamental marketing principle uh, that also applies in retail. But what are the options for the brand? Uh, if you look at the chart, the brand basically, you know, supply products through their own stores. Uh, and some of them have their own website presence where they also allow customers to buy online and sometimes also through a mobile application, right? So that gives them these three options. Some would just stick to the store and some may extend to the digital side already. Um, but the other options are that these brands can work with regional retailers or even global retailers and use uh, these retailers' store website and mobile application as well, which are other options. But that at the end gives a lot of options for the brand. We need to decide the best choices considering the return on investment for them. But that also a lot of options for the buyer who must take the connection, uh, make the connection between a brand and a sales touch point. So I took I took the example of a Black and Decker a wireless drill, and and apply that model. Interestingly, the Black and Decker drill can be purchased in store, but you need to go to a Deval store. If you go on the Black & Decker website, you can buy the, the drill, but as at the moment of the transaction, you're being redirected to the regional hardware supplier. So you don't make the transaction from the Black & Decker website itself. And I even tried the app, and the app is just about uh, registering the, the, the parts that you have bought from Black & Decker, but there is no uh, catalog of product or uh, buying uh, options over there. On the other hand, the regional hardware supplier has uh, is selling these products in store. Of course, uh, you can buy it from their website and even from their uh, mobile application. And on Amazon, you will find uh, the drill uh, on the on the Amazon website or the Amazon mobile application. So that tells us tells us that the the Black and Decker strategy here is to differ. The, the digital shopping experience to business partners already mature in that space. Black & Decker chose not to own that part. And when you think about it, going through a trusted application or website versus adding a new digital sales channel for the consumer sounds like the best choice to ensure that the buyer completes the digital purchasing. And that means that in order to build its own digital strategy and make informed decision or direct sales to consumer or partnership options, the brand need marketing intelligence metrics on the audience of consumers that they are aiming to reach. Well, now let's see how communication service providers can help them. Uh, 
As part of their own digital transformation journey, CSPs have, have adopted new analytics solutions that allow them to operate differently. If you look at the diagram here, you, you see that this is the analytics framework for CSPs with the customer sitting at the center of the OSS and the BSS driven analytics. Now, what does customer centricity mean for CSPs who traditionally have been focused on operating their network considering KPIs defined after network performance metrics? Well, today we want to focus on the right side of the diagram where behavioral analytics is used today by CSPs to understand the demand in data services from a customer standpoint and consider each individual subscribers based on how where and when they interact with the network. And you see, at that point, a subscriber is no more uh, someone characterized with a data plan and um, a specific phone uh, and a monthly you know, bill, et cetera. This is really someone who has an intent on the network. And why is that so important? Well, behavioral analytics combine network data with the application used by uh, use and the web the websites visited by subscribers and that gives us a, a rich set of dimensions characterizing each individual customer interacting with the network at that point the analytics provide product managers the market data needed to design and roadmap competitive digital services Applying the same analytic principles to support business partners such as the retailers in other industries is a natural extension to their business operations. <clears throat> At that time, the marketing operations team can now position these digital services to the right audience, considering the combination of behavioral characteristics that define the best target for these products. Now, let's look at this into more details. At the bottom of this chart, you see the CSP's network with the fixed line on the right side and the mobile network on the left side, and both generate what we call application events. Application events are coming from the interaction of the subscribers with the network. So each time someone uses his phone to visit a website or uh, use an, an application, that creates a series of uh, events that we call application events and this is the big data uh, coming from the network once the big data is collected enriched and processed by the behavioral analytics the data the, the insights are available for the csps to operate their business operations On the left side here in blue you see for instance how customer characteristics based on usage of the network can be correlated for audience analysis uh, purposes uh, with CRM and billing data that is hosted within the CSP environment, as well as uh, sending these customer characteristics to DMPs, um, which allow, uh, which with the with the goal of uh, of doing some customer 360 uh, use cases. Additionally, behavioral analytics uh, provides trends of usage. And most of all, baseline deviation of these trends, so that any change in the trend is uh, explained by, by a baseline deviation, and the baseline deviation will tell the CSP if that trend is just normal, or if that's a, a difference compared to the historical data that they should pay attention to. Another key asset provided by the behavioral analytics is the subscriber clustering capabilities. We're talking about millions of subscribers and devices connected to the network. So we need to to provide a certain level of view where you understand the audiences and, and CSPs need to have a macro view to say, okay, these are, uh, I have right now five, 10, 20 major audiences that I need to consider on my network. So behavioral analytics will regroup the, 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 the subscribers based on, on the main characteristics that they are uh, showing up based on their usage. And uh, the comparison analysis will follow to compare the to to compare the segments and understand the commonalities or the differentiating drivers across these segments. In addition to that, behavioral analytics also provide usage insights for competitive analysis purposes, because CSPs are selling their own applications 
and, and they are positioning their applications against competitive OTTs on, on the network. So they are using the competitive matrix analysis to understand the distribution of usage across their own uh, application and the competitive services from their application consumer standpoint. And that leads to the impact analysis, which is when looking at this uh, competitive matrix over time will indicate some, some variation of usage and potential impact uh, coming introduced by a competitor on their own consumers. Now let's translate these analytics capabilities to the right side of the screen for online retailers. First, audience measurement KPIs can be, can be made available for retailers via a B2B data broker. That could be just reports or that could be APIs for more on-demand data access for the retailer. Now, footfall analysis is also an interesting consideration because CSPs have the, the ability to provide precise location. They, they have access to their S1 MME data, which gives precise location based on the cell ID attached of the device. And uh, the population at that point can be geo-distributed and analyzed by favorite brand interaction, hour of the day, day of the week. And this can be useful for use cases like billboarding advertising, or uh, measuring how different audiences are matching the potential regional retailer store location, for instance. That re potential regional retailer store could become the next uh, partner for the brand and, the, uh, and the, the retailer ecosystem. This partnership between the CSP and the retailer can be extended to running targeted marketing programs, leveraging the CSP's campaign management system. The, the, the behavioral analytics have the ability to provide targeted customer segments, either directly or coming from the audience analysis that the, the CSP uh, is able to execute. And that leads to, up, to running optimized awareness, retention and conversion program and optimize in a way that you don't want to spam uh, individuals. You want to address the right people with the right message. Um, people who you see are already aware that they may be very good candidate for uh, getting, for instance, the campaign, for being addressed with a campaign. But they, if you see that they're already uh, visiting your website as a brand or using your application, they don't need to be uh, targeted in an awareness campaign. So you want to save them for another, uh, for instance, retention program. At the end, CSPs have the ability to connect the brand with the right buyers considering their favorite online shopping platforms or their favorite in, uh, instant messaging communication tools and prefer social media channels. Now let's, let's look at just a few examples of public references from around the globe. Uh, I will start with Claro in LATAM, in Latin America. They have acknowledged that the retail is one of the most highly challenged sectors by competitive changes and digital transformation. And this is not to mention in the context of the COVID today. They are proposing, Claro, they are proposing a series of solutions to connect the industry with, as they call it, their digitally evolved customers. Interestingly, in Canada, Bell is having the same approach and they are proposing a series of innovative products oriented toward helping retail businesses increasing their sales and enhancing their customer experience. If we look at Vodafone in the UK, they talk about personal experience and location-based analytics as big trends to be considered for retailers to get closer to, the, to their customers. Vodafone also highlights how important it is to collect and analyze customer insights before considering providing a customer-centric experience. And finally, Orange Front, interestingly, they are, they are positioning omnichannel solutions for unifying the in-store and the out-of-store sales channels. They are also proposing a series of cloud-based analytics solutions for retailers. And I will continue with our partner, Geo, in, in India. Geo is an American in India that is suffering from a lack of structure for local retailers to adopt the digital transformation. <clears throat> so with the objective of connecting these regional brands to the consumer, 
geo strategies is to first engage with the local brands and then provide a portfolio of online shopping applications to uh, the consumers. And this portfolio, you, you see, you, you get a sample on this chart on the left side here in, in the red section. You see, uh, for instance, Real, Reliance Fresh, an application to order and get delivered some fresh food. And that goes to uh, another application called AGO uh, that we see here on the screen, which is an online shopping uh, platform for, for fashion. So they are basically going with one application per uh, retail vertical. Now, to, 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 to measure and, and improve this, uh, this, uh, this uh, operation, they are using behavioral analytics to identify newly visited retail brands on, the, on their network or competitive retail brands that gives intelligence to the brands already covered in these applications. But they are also measuring their own application usage against competitive services for, for the, their own customer awareness and adoption. And with these insights, they drive targeted and personalized awareness and retention programs to the right people on the network. I will conclude uh, this discussion with key takeaways on, on, on the topic. First, retailers can benefit from CSPs on digital transformation. They are mature, they have, they have grown through their, their own digital experience, and they have uh, the assets support them. The customer is at the center of the CSP operations and business decision. This is the customer centricity that is essential for success in the retail industry. And by adopting behavioral analytics, CSPs are now equipped with valuable tools and data to support retailers' digital strategy and operations. Today, we see CSPs are engaging in B2B programs, including the retail industry, and it's a very good timing to engage into that business relationship. With that said, I will give the hand back to Stephen and thank you for listening. Thank you, Nico. Fantastic presentation. And what comes to my mind is how the network knows what I need to buy before I realize I want to buy it. Um, and how powerful the network is in the collection process of understanding who I am as a digital citizen along the way. So all of that data collection and analysis that you spoke of that can be used in the context of marketing has is really being done behind the scenes by the CSP and with coordination. Uh, fascinating, fascinating subject. Um, with that, I'm gonna switch over to our uh, Q&A and uh, specifically, we're gonna look at our uh, questions here. The first question I have, um, oh, sorry. First, before, I have a poll, quick poll. Uh, for your CSPs out there, uh, if you're using behavioral analytics and you're trying to do audience measurement, which option best describes you as a retailer or CSP and your preference? Is it retailer prefers receiving periodic reports and audience measurement? Is it the re retailer prefers having on-demand access to audience measurement? The CSP, do you prefer sending periodic reports on audience management and the CSP, do you prefer to get an on-demand access to audience management? And then in, in this context, the CSP is working with the online retailer to provide information. So uh, which of these scenarios best supports your particular uh, mode of operation as it relates to behavioral analytics and audience measurement? We have roughly on-demand, on, -demand, on both um, retailer and CSP with the majority of the retailer uh, seeking the ability to have on-demand access to audience measurement. Makes sense, they're closer to the product, they're closer to the marketing stream. Um, the CSP in this case is serving and delivering, if you will, insights, uh, but doing that in both contexts on, on demand uh, gives access to real-time metrics. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists to turn on their cameras if they haven't already, and I'm going to ask a few questions that we've gotten from our audience so far. Uh, first question is for Ross. Ross, how do you see online shopper expectations shifting in the move to mobile commerce? What, do you, what are the big trends you see um, as online shoppers' expectations are starting to change as it relates to customer engagement and the online retail experience? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, 
I mean, I think that, you know, if you look at Amazon again, uh, we've been kind of looking at the uh, the signal in, in the market for a while, right? And, and, and testing a lot of those um, hypotheses. So if you go back to like 2000, um, you know, the start of, of super saver shipping really kind of start looking at shortening that the time to get products to customers typically five to eight days um, so that's evolved over the you know the years you know 2005 we came up with prime member shipping which is two days um, and then I think interestingly uh, the evolution of that uh, with prime now again shortening that that time horizon to what Amazon kind of unveiled in 2020, actually pre-COVID, was um, the, the ability to ship millions of kind of everyday items, uh, same day delivery. So kind of emulating that in-store experience via the mobile experience, if you like. So those things you would traditionally you know, run down to Walgreens or Rite Aid um, to get, you could actually get delivered with in uh, you know, the same day time horizon. So. I think interestingly, we you know we're looking at the signals in the market and the need for customers for immediacy prior to COVID. So I think that's probably why um, you know Amazon was so well positioned uh, leading up to this that there was an expectation that consumers wanted you know a real time experience in in delivery of items. Obviously, the scale and impact of COVID um, you know uh, magnified that to to a degree that we couldn't. You know, imagine, but um, you know, I think that's that's probably the way it's going to go going forward. That you know, people are going to want that same experience of buying online, but getting almost immediately that that item, and obviously that will evolve into drones and delivery mechanisms like that in the future. The access is absolutely critical. So getting access to the right products, and then the expediency of the delivery is an expectation exactly. that you all have set. But I think that society requires, especially as we move from bricks to clicks. Agreed, yeah. Um, I have another um, question, it's for Nico. It's on the analytics side. Do you see the, the business model, uh, oh sorry, it's uh, how can CSPs develop uh, business to business partnership business models with the retail industry without compromising a customer's identity? I guess this is a, it could be a two-parter. Saul can answer some as well. Yeah, definitely. I, I can start. Uh, it's a very good question. I think uh, I, I really believe that the analytics solution first must, must be compliant with GDPR. Uh, I mean, you know, when, when you think of the traffic coming from the network, the, the we, we, we were talking, I think Saul was talking about PII information, which is personal identifi identifiable information. This is typically, for instance, the MSSDN, the MZ information available on the network, and that has to uh, to be managed very carefully. So GDPR applies, we see it applied differently from a region to another, so it's hard to give one answer. I don't think there is one answer that will fit all the, the, the cases here, but depending on the local regulation, I think the, the key is that the analytics solution must have the ability to process encrypted or hash PII information and still provide the audience measurement information. In some cases, uh, the CSP will own uh, the PII data and will have the ability to store PII data non-encrypted because it stays within their own environment. But if the data is exposed to uh, business partners such as retailers, the data will definitely, actually will not even be uh, communicated. So it's not about giving a list of subscribers, but it's about giving audience measurement information, such as percent of total. Uh, and as long as the total also remains in a certain, uh, 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 above a certain minimum of subscribers uh, accounted. So you, you can even move that further and make sure that the APIs as well that are used by internal or external system for, from the CSPs are also considering hashing some part of information beyond the PII information itself. So there's a lot of tools. Definitely the, the behavioral analytics has to, uh, to be ready to, to be configured actually to support them depending on the region and adapt the, to the local regulation. And, uh, and then it's a matter of looking at the data from, from an audience standpoint uh, and not by subscriber itself. 
Thank you, Nico. Maybe you without... want to add something to that? Yeah. So I on did, the passion side of it, um, maybe some techniques and approaches that you can speak to to make sure that that PII is kept safe and intact. Yeah, I think you know what. Probably just the bigger step back is the the best practice is de-identification or anonymization, right? You just don't have it. Don't I don't identify the data to the customer if you can as early as possible, right? That's the best practice. Now, if you can't, then there's lots of tools, techniques, and ways to to, to, to meet the compliance, still have the flexibility and the value you need, as Nico pointed out, because. You know, I've been doing encryption for a long time, and the one thing you never want to do with encryption is actually break the application, right? You don't want to break the value, right, the, the, the solution itself. So the balance has got to be struck, but you know, if you can, get the data out there. Uh, either get rid of it, de-identify it, or things like tokenization, hashing, those encryption where you have to keep the data, you keep it in place. Those are all techniques to deal with data that you can't get rid of, or at least you can't push it to the side. Fascinating. The, you know, these topics today uh, shine a light on how fast our, our world is transforming and the importance of things like security and access um, and also information. And you guys have represented that very well today. I want to thank each of you for presenting today and um, sharing your best practices and experiences with the audience. Um, I want to also uh, inform the audience that uh, this session is being recorded and will be available on demand as well for further viewing or publication on our uh, off of our website. Just you know, if you if you come today, you can watch the webs uh, you can watch this webinar again on demand. And I want to also say that after today's presentation, we'll do a short poll related to the um, the webinar itself and and really in this in the really hopes of gaining more insight and feedback on better improving our. Uh, webinar events for future uh, right, future parts of our series. So we thank you today. Thank you again, Ross. Thank you, Saul. Thank you, Nico, thank for you. all your wisdom thank in you. this particular area and domain. And we uh, hope everyone had a great session today. And we look forward to seeing you on our next one. Take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Bye.